evening. And welcome to the second of our four lectures in this four-part series on pivotal US elections, presented by Professor Margaret O'Mara. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Lynn Thomas, and I'm the chair of the Department of History. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who introduced yourselves to me after the lecture last week. It was a pleasure to learn about the different connections that you've had to the department over the years. As you know, if you attended last um, Tuesday's lecture, Margaret is a historian of the 20th century US. She specializes in political and urban history. But in addition to being an academic, from 1993 to 1997, Margaret was a staff member in the Clinton White House. There, she worked on policy issues, including urban economic development, health care, and welfare reform. Last week, Margaret discussed the 1912 election. And in that election, you'll recall, um, former, well, then former President Teddy um, Roosevelt tried running for president once again. In tonight's lecture, Margaret will move to the election of 1932, where Teddy's very distant cousin, FDR, made his first run at the White House. So please join me in welcoming Margaret back to the stage. Hello, everyone. It's great to be back. Um, and thank you so much for your sacrifice tonight. <laughs> because if you're watching at home, this, is, uh, this talk is going on the evening of the second presidential debate of the 2012 election. And all of these political junkies here in the room are missing it in order to come and hear me. So I am very appreciative. Thank you. What's, it's being TiVo. <laughs> Yes, I hope you have your, your, uh, your recorder, recording going at home. But I'm sure it will be in an endless loop and you can go, go back and see all the analysis. You can watch Fox News or MSNBC or just go back and forth to see the different takes on it. Um, so the, the people and events I'm going to talk about tonight have been in the news a lot over the past four years. And as we wrestle with the Great Recession, we hear a lot about how this is like the Great Depression. We have some telling us that the solution should be another New Deal. We have others telling us that we should do exactly the opposite. So let's compare what's similar and what's different from 1932 to 2012. Then and now, America was recovering from a decade that was one big party. The 1920s was a decade of prosperity, of progress, of optimism. It was also a decade of real estate speculation, easy credit, and low savings. Sound familiar? Kind of like our economy in 2008, it was in fact a house of cards that came tumbling down quite easily to the surprise of a lot of the guys in charge. There was a housing bubble that popped. There we go. There was the end of easy credit. There was severe income inequality. In the 1920s, the richest 1% of Americans got a lot richer, while the other 99% had pretty modest incomes. And some Americans were left out of prosperity and progress altogether. There was a European debt crisis. We think of economic globalization as a new thing. It's not. America's Great Depression was so great in part because our economy and Europe's were closely intertwined. And like today, economic malaise was hard to shake off. This meant the guy in charge was taking a lot of the blame. With everything so unpredictable, political groups on the far left and the far right of the political spectrum were getting traction. There were also fights over social issues in 1932, or I should say one issue in particular, prohibition. 
The great national experiment with banning the sale and distribution of alcohol was over a decade old, and many people felt it was a failure. Other Americans felt very strongly that it should continue. Like gay marriage or abortion today, whether a politician was wet or dry was a political litmus test, and both parties fought within themselves over well, about whether prohibition was a good idea. So economic crisis, a shortage of bold ideas, polarizing social issues led in 1932 to the same thing they lead to today, political gridlock in Washington, D.C. Congress seemed to get little things, few things passed, and the parties spent most of their time just fighting with one another. So what was different? Well, the government was a very different animal in 1932. There were no banking regulations like we have now. Banks both too big to fail and too little to survive all went under. The government did not have big social insurance programs like Social Security and Medicare, which meant that spending was lower, but there were fewer things in place to keep people, keep people from falling over the economic cliff. There also was a relative lack of information in 1932 Washington. This is a critical difference. Today, we are awash in a sea of information. We have the monthly jobs reports, unemployment data, et cetera, et cetera. In 1932, we didn't have as much of this. And what we did have was not as accurate or predictive of what might happen. So all of this meant that the Depression hit people very, very hard. People who had been economically secure, even quite prosperous, their whole lives now faced unemployment and homelessness. And unlike today, the Depression kept on getting worse. Unemployment get, kept on getting higher. More businesses and banks kept on failing. Hunger and poverty kept on rising. By the time Franklin Roosevelt took office, the unemployment rate was about 25%. Today, it's just under 8%. So voters in 1932 didn't care that much about how political leaders did something. They just wanted them to do something to fix it. So why was 1932 a pivotal election? Tonight, I'm going to talk about three reasons it was. One, the economic collapse of the United States demanded new policy solutions. Two, it was a campaign that showed the importance of stagecraft, of strategy, and demonstrated the rise of a new breed of campaign professionals. And three, it was a campaign where the relationship between the politician and the voter, the president and, or the presidential candidate and the citizen, where it became personal. So let's get started. We tend to mark the, begin, the crash of the stock market on Black Thursday, October 24th, 1929, as the beginning of the Great Depression. It's important to remember the crash was not the only cause of the Great Depression, and that the Depression was so severe because of the way the US economy had grown in the 1920s. The nation was really two Americas, divided and unequal. This had a big political impact. The rich got much richer in the 1920s. They saw a 75% income. Um, increase in real income between 1920 and 1929. The rest of the nature, nation only got moderately better, a 9% increase in real income. Put it this way, on the eve of the Depression, the 30,000 richest families in the United States earned more than the 11 million families at the bottom. At a time when the minimum income deemed necessary for a decent standard of living was $2,500 per family. How many families made less than that in 1929? 71% of American families. And here's another dimension of the American divide of the 1920s. The urban centers, like here in Seattle, were prospering in the 1920s. Good manufacturing jobs paid well enough for families to buy cars, to go to the movies, go to baseball games. Women cut their hair. Um, they listened to jazz. Prohibition was openly flouted in the cities. But over 40% of Americans still lived in rural areas in 1930, and their 1920s were very, very different. More than 80% of the rural population did not have indoor plumbing in 1930. 
98% of American farmhouses did not have electricity. Threatened by the decadence of the cities that they saw, the read about in the newspapers and they watched at the weekly picture show, rural people even more strongly, strongly felt, believed in traditional values. They were strong supporters of continuing prohibition. And as often happens in times of economic crisis, some people took their anger out on others. The Ku Klux Klan saw its highest national membership ever in the 1920s, and it wasn't just a Southern phenomenon. Some of the biggest chapters were north of the Mason-Dixon line. In 1932, both parties had to reckon with the magnitude of this, of not only the magnitude of the economic crisis, but with the realities of this divided America, separate, unequal. And they had two very different answers to the problem. Now, in the rankings of worst presidents that people do from time to time, Herbert Hoover's name sometimes comes up. His name is associated today with so many of the worst things about the Great Depression. This obscures the extraordinary career that Hoover had before the Depression, and the fact that he was once one of the most admired men in America and the world. And his personal story is extraordinary. He was born in West Branch, Iowa in 1874. He was orphaned at a relatively early age, and he was sent in this direction to live with an aunt and an uncle out in Oregon's Willamette Valley. He went to Stanford, which had been just founded that year and was tuition free. Any parents of college kids in the room are groaning right now. Um, but a perfect destination for a penniless kid from rural Oregon. He graduated, still broke, and went to work as a miner. But he was smart, and he worked really hard, and he got promoted very quickly. He moved up the ranks. He, first, he was working in the mines, then he, got, he was promoted to writing the mining reports. Then he became a mine manager. He started going all around the world, working in mines in Australia and China. He finally ended up in London as a partner in the entire operation. And at age 32, he retired a multimillionaire. He stayed in London after that, living the good life. And when war broke out in 1914, he found himself stranded. But because he was a very smart guy, he was quick quickly tapped to provide relief to the 10 million civilians in Belgium and in northern France who were trapped between German and Allied lines. It was a massive logistical operation, and he excelled at it. Hoover later called the job the most unpleasant and saddest thing he ever had to do. The sight of the bread lines brought him to tears. When the U.S. entered the war, um, Woodrow Wilson recruited Hoover to come back to the United States to run the U.S. Food Administration, which was, again, a massive logistical operation, both rationing food at home and distributing food um, to, the, to the troops overseas. Hoover had been out of the country for years, and no one knew whether he was a Democrat or a Republican. Hearing of the appointment, members of Congress actually questioned whether, uh, whether Wilson should be appointing this foreigner, and some of them actually questioned whether Hoover was a citizen. Imagine that. <laughs> Hoover's work during the war showcased his management talents and his marketing savvy. His agency used slogans and mass marketing to persuade citizens to join in the cause. War relief posters proclaimed, food will win the war. Hoover became so famous that his name became a verb. Families hooverized by rationing food. After the war, Hoover for President Club sprang up spontaneously around the country, but voters still didn't know what party he belonged to. And there was a huge amount of pressure on Hoover to run for president in 1920. So he reluctantly put his hat in the ring for the California primary as a Republican. And he lost, in a big way. His opponent was progressive California Governor Hiram Johnson, and, Roosevelt, and Hoover was soon out of the race. But he picked up the pieces. He endorsed Warren Harding. Harding won. And Hoover was rewarded by getting a cabinet appointment in his administration, the Secretary of Commerce. Now, this wasn't that big of a job. It still isn't one of the plum cabinet jobs in, in presidential administrations. But Hoover made it bigger. 
He negotiated leadership on a lot of issues, and newspapers started calling him the secretary of everything. In 1922, Hoover published a book that gave a window into the way he approached the world. And it's kind of instructive if we want to understand the Hoover as president and the Hoover during the Great Depression. This book was titled American Individualism. It's still in print. You can buy it um, at your favorite bookseller or online or in, in, in bricks and mortar. In it, Hoover revealed himself as a reasonable moderate. He thought laissez-faire approaches allowed inequality and inefficiency. But centralized state planning stifled cooperative, uh, cooperation and individual freedoms. Instead, he argued that the true American system was one that mixed individual freedom with measures that steered and encouraged the economy and the society in, in the right direction. He believed in fairness. He believed in things that encouraged meritocracy. Remember, this is a guy who started off as a penniless orphan, and he ended up a multimillionaire. He really believed in pull yourself up with your bootstraps through hard work. He thought that anyone had the potential to do the same. And in practice, this meant voluntary coordination between business and labor and government. The best outcomes, Hoover felt, came when leaders got together, decided on the wisest course of action, informed by da data, above petty politics, and acting cooperatively. Wouldn't that be nice if Washington, D.C. always worked that way? But Hoover soon found that it did not. American individualism shows us a Hoover who was very different than the Republican presidents he worked for. Both Harding and Coolidge were kind of were laissez-faire. Um, one of the reasons that the 20s were the roaring 20s and were so unequal was that the market was allowed to roam free. And, um, and we need to keep this in mind when we think about um, the legacy of Hoover, someone who often gets sort of written off as a do-nothing, a guy who didn't do anything about the Depression. He actually believed in a limited and strategic deployment of government resources. For example, one of the things he really believed that only the government could do was build infrastructure. So it helps explain by one, why one of our greatest landmarks is named after him, the Hoover Dam, which was a project that got started when he was president. But Hoover did not think the government needed to do the work of charity. And his response to another crisis before his presidency illustrates that. In 1927, the Mississippi River flooded its banks. About 27,000 square miles of land in Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi was underwater. 700,000 people were displaced. 246 people died. And remember, this is a very, was and is a very, very poor part of the United States. Hoover coordinated the government response. He was still Secretary of Commerce. And he felt that his role was to reassure the public, to coordinate private relief e efforts, and deploy government resources for infrastructure, but not to individual economic assistance, short term or long term. So the Red Cross was the organization that distributed food and tents to the vic victims. And the government stuck to emergency evacuations and building levees, by and large. Hoover felt that the flood experience vindicated his belief that private aid, not government help, was the way to handle individual needs. And he carried this philosophy with him after becoming president. But before we get to that, let's talk about Hoover's opponent. In contrast to Herbert Hoover, Franklin D. Roosevelt was a child of privilege. He was born in 1882 into a wealthy New York family. He was so much younger than his older siblings that he was raised effectively as an only child. Theodore Roosevelt was a cousin of his, distant cousin. Um, but his branch of the family was quite different from Franklin's. There's a story that when the children of Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, who were about the same age, would get together on family vacations, um, Teddy's kids looked down on Franklin because he liked sailing. And, um, and, and Teddy had insisted all his children row their boats because it was more strenuous. <laughs> Roosevelt was a, Teddy, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a witty, friendly guy, but in his younger years and into his college days, he really didn't seem to impress anyone with his weighty intellect. His college nickname was Feather Duster. <laughs> he was a lifelong Democrat. His only vote on the Republican side was when his cousin Teddy was running for re-election in 1904. He entered Democratic politics formally in 1910. 
when he ran for New York State Senate. He won narrowly, re representing his home district of Dutchess County, which was largely rural. And this is an important, important part of, of understanding Roosevelt. Representing a rural district gave him an understanding of rural life and a credibility with rural voters that would prove very valuable in the decades ahead. He won re-election in 1912, but he didn't finish out his term as he was recruited by the newly elected President Wilson to join his administration in Washington. The job he took was the one that his cousin Teddy had taken when he first arrived, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. During his time in the Wilson administration, Roosevelt and Hoover got to know each other. Um, they attended the same dinner parties. They were colleagues, and they kind of had the same politics. They were centrists. They were progressive. They were reformers. By 1920, their political lives had diverged. Hoover ran as a Republican for president, and Roosevelt was the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket the same year. Because the men lost touch with each other after their days in Washington, they had the same, they, they really uh, didn't perceive, they, they had these, the wrong perception about what the other had become. They saw them, the, kind of their image of one another was frozen in amber. Uh, Hoover thought that Roosevelt was the same man that he'd known in 19-teens Washington. And Roosevelt thought the same. And this was very important and played a role in 1932. Because the 1920s changed both men in critical ways, especially Franklin Roosevelt. During the summer of 1921, Roosevelt contracted polio while on summer vacation. Polio transformed Roosevelt. He had to drop out of public life. He had months and years of rehabilitation. His wife, Eleanor, later observed that this experience of polo made Ro polio made Roosevelt far more patient. The restless and energetic Roosevelt finally had to sit still. It also made this son of privilege have a whole new understanding of reliance on others. Roosevelt's recovery depended on so many people, family, friends, doctors, nurses, hospitals, rehab facilities. He started realizing that you needed to have a broader community to bring you back, to put you back on your feet. And he also realized that for most people who didn't have the resources that he had, they needed some, broad, some other entity, perhaps the, the government, to help them in times of need. He believed that people could not do it alone, that individualism was not the answer. Hoover is writing about American individualism, and Roosevelt's personal experience and his political philosophy is, or is, is evolving into one that is more cooperative, more collaborative, more um, communitarian. And he felt like the government needed to play this critical role in ensuring people's economic welfare. This is the key idea that undergirds his candidacy and the New Deal of his presidency. FDR finally came back into the political spotlight in 1924. He came to the Democratic National Convention to give a speech in support of his political mentor and fellow New Yorker, Governor Al Smith, who was running for president. It was a dramatic moment. Everyone knew of Roosevelt's illness. Everyone knew how disabling polio could be. Roosevelt had prepared for this moment for months and years. He had strengthened his upper body so that he could grip railings and podiums, swinging up stairs and holding himself upright with upper body strength alone. He learned how to use gestures and leaning forward on the podium and using a loud voice and, and expressions to get everyone to focus on the waist up, not at the, the, the powerless legs below. After his comeback in the 1924 convention, he went back to work, behind the political scenes, building important networks and alliances within the Democratic Party. This is another thing that polio gave Roosevelt. It took him out of the game, not running for election, during a decade when Democrats were losing election after election. He finally came back in 1928, when Al Smith vacates the New York governor's office to run for president again, and Roosevelt runs for governor of New York and wins. Smith loses the election, and so by the time Herbert Hoover got to the White House, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was one of the most prominent and powerful Democrats in America. Two men with different visions, 
One thought government action should be limited, building things, not government handouts or mandates on business. Another thought the government had a bigger role to play, and that in times of trouble, the government needed to do more to help individual people get back on their feet. These differences mattered in 1932, but so did the way they were communicated to the voters. The second part of the story of 1932 is the rise of a set of people and political approaches that we didn't see as much of before then, and that we see a lot of today. Let's start with a guy named Charlie. After Hoover's victory, Republicans controlled the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. The Democrats decided they needed to fight back. And they did something innovative. They hired a full-time journalist. Charles Michelson, away from his newspaper job, and installed him as the party's first full-time publicity director. Now, campaigns had had press secretaries before, but that was usually when a campaign was going on. Our guy Charlie here was hired to hammer away at the Republicans while they were just trying to govern. And this was a new innovation. We are still living with its legacy today. He wrote speeches that congressional Democrats gave on the House and Senate floor. He wrote press releases, shot them out to hundreds of newspapers. He came up with pithy sound bites and slogans. The Republicans did not have a comparable spin machine. Instead, they had a president who seemed to be hopeless at spin. This is ironic. Before he was president, Herbert Hoover had the reputation of having a great relationship with the press. He understood that politics needed to be thinking about advertising and marketing. In his 1928 campaign, here he is on the stump in 19, 1928, Hoover had been really, really savvy about this. He looked at his base of political support like a corporate CEO looks at a potential customer base. He divided them up into market se segments. He appealed to different interest groups. He used new communication technologies to appeal to voters and matched his message to the media. He went on the radio, and this was a huge advantage. His flat Midwestern accent was, was such a contrast to that of his opponent. Al Smith was a New Yorker through and through. He had a honking New York accent like you don't even hear anymore. And so to people sitting in middle America, already suspicious of cities and Catholics and immigrants, Al Smith's voice did not fly. So Hoover had an advantage on that. Hoover also used film to his advantage. And this is at a time when 90 million movie tickets are being sold per week. Basically, three out of four Americans are going to the movies on a weekly basis. It was part of life. In the 1928 campaign, Hoover not only made campaign films, but made talking pictures, a brand new innovative technology. The Jazz Singer comes out in 1927, only one year before the first talkie. So that's what makes it so mystifying that Hoover, as president, seemed to lose his smooth footing with the press rather quickly. He wasn't a president of sound bites. He became a president of lengthy explanations. He also talked in a way that seemed oblivious to the suffering of the Great Depression. Because after the stock market crash of 1929, Hoover saw his most important job being to reassure anxious Americans that everything would be all right. And based on his experience, he felt it would be eventually. Because he had a 19th century understanding of how the economy worked, and so did most of the people around him. There were plenty of economic downturns in the 19th century. It was a perennial and unavoidable feature of industrial capital capitalism. And Hoover figured this was simply another one of those, and the market would eventually sort itself out. And yes, he and his administration were working behind the scenes, but they really were working literally behind the scenes. They weren't t taking up a lot of airtime saying, we're doing all these things to try and help you. Instead, what he said publicly was he used, tried to reassure the public, and, and, and it backfired, really. Um, you know, one of the things he actually tried to do to reassure people was he started calling this crisis a depression, 
because he thought that calling it a panic would make people too agitated. <laughs> um, so he also was kind of quick to seize on any good economic news. When the economy had a little uptick in March 1930, Hoover declared the depression is over. He thought negative thinking was dragging everyone down. In October 1930, he said, the income of a large part of our people is not reduced by the depression, but is affected by unnecessary fears and pessimism. When he started looking at the campaign ahead, he and the others in the GOP thought the election would not turn on the economy, but on social issues, especially prohibition. Wrong. People were upset, and Hoover was getting blamed for it. One of the reasons Hoover is taking so much of the blame is that in the good times, he took a lot of the credit. Um, we've, many have heard of the, 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 you know, the Hoover slogan, a chicken in every pot, that, that he uh, allegedly promised in the 1928 campaign. Actually, that wasn't him. It was the Republican Party. But he did say, uh, do other things that, that, that kind of said the same thing. He and the GOP had um, identified themselves very closely with prosperity in 1928. The Hoover campaign gave out breadboards reading, vote for Hoover and your board will never lack a loaf. Um, they distributed lucky pennies that read good for four more years of prosperity. And on the stump, Hoover proclaimed, quote, we in America today are nearer the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of this land. Another reason that Hoover got the blame was that Charlie Michelson made sure he would. When shanty towns became, became, started to spring up in cities across the country, including here in Seattle, this is taken from Seattle's um, encampment just where the, where the stadiums are, are right now, um, filled with unemployed and homeless men. Michelson gave them a name, Hoovervilles. He got Democrats to hammer Hoover on the economy. Day after day, congressmen and senators got up, raged against Hoover. And Hoover read all of his bad press, which you're never supposed to do, right? If you're a politician or a movie star, you never read your bad reviews. Um, and Hoover started to hate the Washington press corps. He previously had had weekly press conferences where pretty much anything was fair game, and he just clammed up. He started to sound like a guy who didn't like his job very much. He referred to the presidency as a repairman's job, where he went from one crisis to another. Hoover liked building things, big landmark projects like wartime food administration. He was someone who really liked to focus in on one big thing at a time. He was not, as we would say in today's parlance, a multitasker. He did not like partisan politics. This is a guy who didn't declare what party he was a member of until he ha absolutely had to. He did not like working with Congress. He didn't understand it. He didn't understand the traditions, the hierarchies, the pettiness. He was an engineer. He liked data-driven solutions. He liked efficiency. Congress? is not efficient. <laughs> Part of his ineffectiveness in responding to the Great Depression during these first three years of it was his dislike of these conventions of Washington. He was not a professional politician. He tried to sidestep Congress for a while. He tried to work directly with business and labor leaders. But the president's job is to introduce legislation, is to work with the legislators. That really does not work. The nation was more than two years into the Depression but when he finally acted more boldly and visible, visibly. He introduced and Congress passed legislation to create the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which would lend money to struggling financial institutions. And this is a landmark, you know, a beginning of, um, of, the, of the New Deal, even though it's not yet the New Deal. While this was critical in shoring up the banking system, it helped only bankers directly. It was something that was critical but very hard for ordinary people to see or understand. He also asked Congress to appropriate more money for farm loans, but it all seemed like too little too late. Franklin Roosevelt had different ideas. While Hoover was stumbling through his presidency, Roosevelt was governing New York State and trying out some ideas that he would later take national with the New Deal. He got state government to provide direct relief and jobs for the unemployed. 
He proved very adept at connecting the city and the countryside uh, with across issues and create, creating these, these coalitions. He also had a human touch, a sense of humor, an ability to connect with political bosses and with voters alike. And part of his effectiveness stemmed from the people who surrounded him. This is another important development we see coming through in the 1932 campaign. Professional campaign advisors whose full-time job was to get a candidate elected and re-elected. They were loyal to the candidate, not just to the party, although they might have worked within the party apparatus. And like Charlie Michelson, they could work just as hard in the off years as they did in the on years. In Roosevelt's case, he had smart combination of people who could do the message and people who could do the politics. His media guy was Lewis Howe, a former political reporter who had been his press operative since his days in the New York State Senate. Roosevelt's political guy was James Farley, a New York Irishman with deep roots in the Democratic Party, but an even greater loyalty to FDR. In the summer of 1931, six months before FDR officially announced his presidential candidacy, these three men hatched up a plan. Farley announced he was going to take a trip to Seattle, but he decided he would make some stops on the way. Visualize this. Roosevelt, Farley, Howe, leaning over a, a table, unfurling three large documents, a map of the United States, a, a railroad map of the United States, a railroad timetable, and a list of Democratic Party officials that Farley should visit on his way to Seattle. The result was a trip that was 30,000 miles long, <laughs> where Farley made stops, as many stops as he possibly could, between Albany and Seattle, to visit as many possible Roosevelt delegates as he could, Democratic Party officials, locking up their loyalty well in advance of Roosevelt announcing his candidacy. The team also understood they needed to lay a good foundation in the press for a possible Roosevelt run. And task number one was to dispel rumors that Roosevelt was not fit enough for the job, that he was too disabled. They planted a story in a national magazine titled is Franklin D. Roosevelt physically fit to be president? The answer, the experts in the article concluded, was yes. And by this time, Roosevelt had become highly skilled at making, masking the fact that he could not walk. He made sure that he wasn't seen in public, much less photographed in a wheelchair. And take a look at this 1928 photograph. Here he is standing tall leaning on only one cane at first glance. But if you look more closely, you see that behind him, he strategically is holding a second cane that's propping himself up, bracing himself so he looks like he's standing independently. This sort of stagecraft is only possible when Roosevelt was not moving. When he needed to move, his son James accompanied him everywhere giving him an arm while Roosevelt supported himself with a cane on the other side. And with his big waves to the crowds, his hearty smile, his jaunty expressions, Roosevelt projected an image of vigor and health. The lengths to which Roosevelt had to go to hide his disability made him acutely aware of image and perception. He learned how to use words and gestures to focus people's attention exactly where he wanted it to go. As he geared up to run for president, Roosevelt was realizing that most people in his Democratic Party were falling into the same trap as Hoover and the GOP. Like the Republicans, many mainstream Democrats also thought that prohibition would be the biggest issue in the 1932 election. Mainstream Democrats also took a somewhat conservative, incremental view about how the government should respond to the economic crisis. And Roosevelt saw this as a real opportunity. He saw that third parties with more radical messages were getting traction. He sensed that voters were deeply frustrated with the status quo in Washington. And he saw firsthand in New York State the powerful impact that government could have on poverty, on unemployment. It seemed like the same thing was needed at the national level. At the very least, they just had to try. <laughs>
He declared his candidacy in January 1932, a week before his 50th birthday. The field was crowded and competitive. Powerful congressional Democrats, like Speaker of the House John Nance Garner, were running. Roosevelt's old ally, and now his rival, Al Smith, was considering it. And to Hoover, Roosevelt seemed like the most beatable of the bunch. Throughout the primary season and into the summer, the White House tracked the Democratic race very closely. And when FDR finally got the nod, they breathed a sigh of relief. This is the guy they wanted to run against. They thought he was beatable. Because Hoover still remembered Roosevelt of the feather duster years, he didn't realize the man that he had become. He's, Hoover said to some, some aides, Roosevelt was, quote, a pleasant fellow and well-meaning, but without a rudimentary grasp of the issues involved. Roosevelt immediately marked his territory by being more liberal and bolder than his competitors. But it's important to understand that he wasn't being, putting out detailed policy proposals. Nor did his campaign indicate that he have, that nothing about his campaign actually indicated that he had a strong ideological agenda. He wasn't running on the issues. He was running on the idea that we needed to test an array of new approaches and see if, work, if they worked. In a May 1932 speech in Atlanta, he said, the country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and, and try it. If it fails, admit it and try another. But above all, try something. This is an important thing to remember about the campaign of 1932. We tend to think that the campaigns of long ago were weighty, substantive affairs, that now we have all fluff, and then it was all substance and policy. And that's not really the case. FDR was very vague about what he was going to do once he got to the White House. And part of this was he was trying to appeal to a very disorganized Democratic Party, a cobbled together bunch of constituencies with very different issues and priorities. Remember, this is an era where well, Will Rogers said, I am not a member of any organized party, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Roosevelt was a savvy politician. He knew to stay away from any third rails of politics. He knew to, to play it safe. And he also understood that he could trump that vagueness with powerful emotional appeals, because that is what people needed at this moment. They were dark economic times. It was the power of emotion, not the details of policy, that would pull these different constituencies together. And this is the critical thing that Herbert Hoover missed. So now we come to the third chapter. And the medium that dominated the final months of this pivotal campaign, radio. By 1932, radios were fixtures in American households. Radio broadcasts already had turned events like Charles Lindbergh's first solo flight over the Atlantic into shared dramas, listened to together live by people from coast to coast. It brought entertainment into people's living rooms, and it was critical for relaying political news. In 1932, the radio networks broadcast gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of both party conventions. Both happened in Chicago, in the relatively new Chicago Stadium, um, and the GOP went first. Hoover, keeping to long-standing tradition, stayed behind in the White House, which is where he'd been for most of 1932. He, although he'd faced a primary challenge, it wasn't a significant one. So he didn't hit the road all that often. Instead, he relied on the advantages of incumbency, presiding over official events, and um, taking advantage of the, the new invention of newsreels that filmed almost anything a president did, filming him looking presidential. Now, this might have been tremendously effective and worked very well in an ordinary year. In 1928, this would have been a great tactic. But this was not an ordinary year. Having a president you know, hanging out in the Rose Garden and a, 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 presiding over you know, official, official White House events wasn't very compelling when people were hungry and jobless. The Republican convention was pretty boring to a radio listener at home. It was carefully planned. It was tightly orchestrated. It was passionless. There were lots of empty seats, and few members of Congress attended. The main focus were platform fights over prohibition, 
This is it. And again, this is something that's getting a lot, still getting a lot of attention among the political elites. The GOP are trying to figure out, should we go wet, should we go dry? The Democrats are saying, come on down, kid. This is the life in the, in the wet trough. Um, there was little mention of the economy or what is to be done about it, even though there were bread lines in the streets of Chicago right outside the stadium. The catchphrase of the Republican convention, don't change horses midstream. They couldn't come up with anything better. Here's the thing. At that point in 1932, the GOP and Hoover really didn't believe the Democrats would win, and a lot of pundits agreed with them. Remember, this is an age with far less information. This includes reliable political polling. Bread lines aside, the, the, bread lines aside, the economy actually was getting better for the first part of 1932, in part because of the measures the Hoover administration and Congress had taken to shore up the banks, to loosen up credit, but Congress went out of session for the whole summer of 1932. And when they did, the Fed tightened up credit again. So the economy started going downward again. In the absence of good economic statistical reporting, the Hoover administration and the folks at the GOP convention didn't understand where it was going. Now the Democratic convention, in the same hall, two weeks later, was nothing but boring. It was a true political spectacle, a cliffhanger. First off, it was a horse race. No candidate, including Franklin Roosevelt, came into the convention with enough delegates to win it. The night of June 30th was nominating speeches. Ten hours of them. <laughs> Beginning at 5 p.m. and going till 3 a.m. in the morning of July 1st. The radio networks kept up coverage through the whole thing. And then, after that, Roosevelt's people decided they'd try and force a vote right then and there at 4.28 a.m., one ballot, two ballots. Roosevelt made small gains, but not decisive ones. It's summer. Everyone's sweating. Jim Farley handed out fans with Roosevelt's picture on them, so everyone's flapping Roosevelt's face in front of them. On the third ballot, at 8 a.m., Roosevelt got five more votes. The exhausted delegates slumped back to their hotel rooms for a nap. And then in the 10 hours that followed, there was furious politicking and backroom deal-making, including a true deal-maker, the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst, owner of a whole chain of influential newspapers across the country, threw his support behind Roosevelt, meaning his editorial pages went with him. So in ballot number four, Roosevelt got it. Then, more drama. FDR seized the media moment, broke with tradition, and flew to Chicago to accept the nomination in person. This was another piece of classic FDR stagecraft. Not only is he doing this unconventional thing at the convention, but he's showing he's tough enough to do it. This was not an easy trip to make by airplane from New York to, to Chicago in 1932, but he had the health, the stamina to do that. He gave a speech promising a new deal for the American people. <coughs> Republicans hadn't talked about the economy, and all the Democrats and Roosevelt did was talk about it. Happy Days Are Here Again was played by the organist at the Chicago Stadium at both conventions. At the GOP one, it sounded like a dirge, and no one really noticed. At the Democratic one, it was picked up by the media as a theme. Roosevelt used the song as a, for every election afterwards. Now, this whole drama was broadcast nationally on the radio. The networks kept up coverage through the whole night of balloting, through Roosevelt's speech and beyond. Hoover's political battering continued through the summer. In late July, he suffered another huge blow. Unemployed World War I veterans from across the country had converged on Washington to demand early payment of their veterans' pensions. These bonus, marches, bonus marchers, as they were called, squatted right in the heart of official Washington. Hoover finally called for them to be removed. He hoped peacefully, and that didn't happen. The troops sent in to do, that, to do so, led by General Douglas MacArthur, and also an up-and-coming officer named Dwight Eisenhower, um, ended up setting up on the marchers very aggressively. The confrontation turned violent. The camps went up in flames. Again, a 
terrible public relations disaster for, Rose, uh, for Hoover, as well as a policy disaster. It reinforced the political narrative that had emerged by July 1932 that Roosevelt was both hap uh, sorry that Hoover was both hapless and heartless. The fall campaign showed the stark contrast between Roosevelt's appeals to the heart and Hoover's appeals to the head. Hoover still was a reluctant campaigner. When he went on the stump, he could be soft-spoken and hard to hear. He was not a fiery orator. He was a great explainer. He scoffed at Roosevelt's use of speechwriters. Instead, he took on the exhausting task of writing all of his speeches himself, loading them with facts and statistics. And they were downers. He was defensive. He was dogmatic. He wasn't giving any, anyone any hope. He was saying, stay the course. This guy is a fool. Stick with me. He didn't have anything positive to give people. And he seemed to forget the power of radio. In fact, earlier in his term, he'd had the opportunity to give 10-minute radio addresses to the American people, just like the fireside chats that Roosevelt would later make famous. And he turned it down. He said, there's no way I can relay any message of substance in 10 minutes. <laughs> Hoover also hated personal interest stories that might make him seem more human and likable, like an ordinary guy, and, and relay his amazing life story and all of his accomplishments. Um, some aides once tried to persuade him to make a documentary about his life. And he said, no, no, no. This would, quote, get votes only from the morons. In contrast, Roosevelt used radio to his advantage. Even with his aristocratic voice, he delivered a message in a way that made him more of a man of the people than Hoover. His words were full of personal stories. He called people my friends. He reassured them. They weren't about statistics. They were comforting. They built trust. And incidentally, radio was a pretty good medium for someone who didn't have use of his legs. On the stump and through the radio, Roosevelt ran a campaign short on facts and long on emotions, and it worked. FDR actually overestimated Hoover. Again, he's thinking about the Hoover of long ago. For a long time, Roosevelt could not believe that a guy he knew was so smart and so savvy would be bungling his campaign so bad badly. He thought there must be some sort of October surprise. He, there must be some grand strategy they're going to pull on us. But then he started to realize that wasn't going to happen. And he also got wind of some of the derogatory things that Hoover and his people were saying about him privately. And he got angry. So he started campaigning harder. And he also realized that he was going to win. In those final weeks, he crossed the country in a custom campaign train labeled the Roosevelt Special, which you see here at its stop in Seattle. Thank you, Museum of History and Industry. Um, it had a fully furnished press car, which was a first in, in presidential campaigning. So he made the reporters very, very well-fed and watered and well-rested. So they would write nice things about him. And the venue was perfect for this disabled master of stagecraft. He would powerfully grasped the railings at the back of the train and the microphone stand. And his voice would boom over the crowd. And he would give some uplifting speech. And the crowd would cheer. And the reporters, after getting off their nice cushy car, would be there in the crowd writing it all down, then get back on and go to the next stop. Hoover also got angry and bitter. And he could not believe that Roosevelt might win. He finally hit the road, but his whistle stops were far less joyous. He stuck to his guns, declaring that, quote, the forces of depression are in retreat. And he declared that, quote, no defense is needed of his administration's policies because they had been the right ones. Roosevelt's campaign train was met with cheers and bouquets of flowers. Hoover's train was met with unemployed men wearing placards saying things like, Hoover, bologna and applesauce. Election day was November 8th. It was a landslide for Roosevelt. He won 472 electoral votes, and Hoover won 59. 
Roosevelt won over 57% of the popular vote. It was a resounding defeat for Hoover and his vision. Most people who run against one another for president end up not liking each other very much. <laughs> Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt ended up hating each other. <laughs> they hated each other so deeply, in fact, that they refused to work together in the four months between election and inauguration, because this is when inauguration still happens in March. Hoover did not want to take full blame for emergency measures like closing the banks. He asked FDR to work jointly with him. Roosevelt, smart politician, did not want to commit, nor share the blame or credit for his rival. So they had a standoff, and the American people suffered. The economy further hurtled downward. By the time that Inauguration Day rolled around, Hoover and Roosevelt shared a car ride from the Capitol to the White House without saying a single word to each other. When FDR came in, his first 100 days of legislation involved enacting into law many things that were already moving through Congress while Hoover was still president. And Roosevelt got full credit. So let's sum up. Why was 1932 a pivotal election? The economic collapse demanded new solutions. The utter failure of capitalism in 1929 and the years that followed opened up American leaders and voters to new ideas. The results were not only progressive, they were a radical reframing of the national government's role in American life. As we see from the 1932 campaign, Roosevelt was not a revolutionary, but he was an experimenter. He wasn't an ideologue, and he wanted to fix capitalism, not overthrow it. But he did stake out a profoundly new role for the government based on the premise that the state had a responsibility to ensure basic economic security for its citizens. It took ideas that had been floating out there ever since the days of the robber barons and turned them into federal agencies. It was a radical notion in 1932, and now it's the status quo. The second reason we have a pivotal election in 1932 was the growing importance of stagecraft, of strategy, a new breed of campaign advisors. Pol Roosevelt's political boss, Jim Farley, wasn't just good at taking 30,000 mile trips across the country. He and his boss were good at bringing in new constituencies into the Democratic Party through their political strategy, their stagecraft, their savvy marketing. They appealed to groups that previously had voted Republican, including groups of native-born working class people and African Americans chief among them. The result was that Democrats enlarged their electoral base in a way that allowed them to dominate national politics for the next 50 years. Now, wasn't, what wasn't obvious at the time was that the 1932 election started to mobilize a new conservative movement. And one of the chief catalysts for this was Herbert Hoover himself. After spending a little time licking his wounds, he came back into public life, swinging hard, he became one of the loudest and fiercest critics of the New Deal, and he helped mobilize conservative business leaders and political leaders against it. His critiques helped seed new interest groups, new political tactics that would help Republicans redefine their base and redefine politics several decades later. Third, it was a campaign where the relationship between the presidential candidate, the politician, and the voter becomes personal. Herbert Hoover lost because he didn't get that it was all about the economy, and he failed to play by the rules of the new media environment. Roosevelt won because he responded to both message and media. Now, we can't blame it all on Hoover's strategy. Part of it was simply incumbency. This was a pretty rotten time to run for re-election. He was trying to stay the course, and no one had faith that the course would correct itself. Again, we're still arguing over what might have happened if the New Deal hadn't happened. It wasn't as if his challenger won on policy, however. The modern method of campaigning, coupled with people's desperation, allowed Roosevelt to get away with vague and sometimes contradictory statements. And we should remember that as well. The big takeaway, though, is how much voters' cho choices hinged on how much they liked or trusted the candidate. Hoover misunderstood the power of image, but he didn't understand how the magnitude of crisis demanded a compassionate, an empathetic leader, not a great engineer.
The legacies of 1932 are with us still. We will judge tonight's presidential debate not just on what candidates say, but on how likable they seem. Campaign strategists and pollsters slice and dice the electorate into every possible interest group and try to squeeze votes out of them. And whether people are avid readers of Paul Krugman or faithful listeners of Rush Limbaugh, everyone operates on a presumption about the way the world works that simply didn't exist prior to 1932. We know that what happens in Washington, D.C. has ripple effects across the country and across the world. Whether we think the government should act to do more or do less, we see the relationship between citizens and their government and their president as a highly personal one. And that is the ultimate legacy of 1932. Thank you very much. And just like last time, I'm, um, I'm going to answer questions from the audience. Those, the, those of you that need to, to leave are welcome to do so. But those who would like to stay for the discussion and questions, you can come to the microphones in the aisle and fire away. Did the congressional election in 1930 give an indication of a swing to the Democrats that would be as large as it turned out to be? Did the congressional election of 1930 give an indication that the Democratic swing was going to be as large as it turned out to be? Um, uh, no. Um, uh, I think that it was certainly a, um, an indication that Republican strength was weakening. But there was not a, um, I think that the degree of the Roosevelt landslide was not something that was predicted. And one of the things that's remarkable about kind of this pre-polling, the, the, this era before the age of modern polling, is, is how they were just guessing about what the outcome of, of, of any election, particularly the election of 32, would be. And the money was on Herbert Hoover. Um, as a, as a contrast, just to show that the main national poll that was sort of the, the, the reliable poll was one that was run by Literary Digest magazine that would send a questionnaire out to its readers. So of course, it's, this is a, a certain market se segment, people who subscribe to Literary Digest and turn their questionnaires back in. And that was the major credible national poll. This was before George Gallup has really gotten his business up and running. So, um, so it was a, uh, it was clear that the Republican Party was on, on you know, rough footing, but there was um, not a, I don't think the realization that the Democrats would win as big, and win as big with Roosevelt was clear at the time. But the, the, as, as often happens in midterm elections, the, the Democrats do make gains in 1930. They get control of the House. They, they, they don't, they're no longer completely in the political wilderness. But 1932 was, was something of a surprise. How much do you think the comparison between Obama and FDR is historically valid, and how much do you think it is a stereotype that's being possibly extorted by both sides? Um, so how much is the comparison between Obama and FDR valid, and how much of it is, is not? That's a great question. Um, I think in some ways there's some interesting similarities. I think if you look at Obama's campaign in 2008 compared to um, Roosevelt's campaign in 1932, you have some similar you know, promising hope and change and, and maybe not worrying about the details all that much. Um, there, he also, you know, Roosevelt is also this somewhat unlikely guy. I mean, he's, he's, he's more of a, you know, he's been governor of the, of the largest state for four years, but he also is this, you know, someone who, who people can't read. The fact that he turns out to be such a, um, you know, a championship of the, of the forgot, what he calls the forgotten man is something that is a real surprise given his background. Um, and many other, you know, people of his, of, his, of his same background refer to him as a traitor to his class. Um, but they're both, um, they're both men who've been underestimated at different points. Um, I think that, they're, that we tend to want to draw comparisons to them because of the, the, the comparisons that we draw between the Great Recession and the Great Depression. Um, and, uh, but I think that you know, it bears noting that, the, um, that Roosevelt had a, not only was this unlikely candidate, but also had this very sort of up and down um, popularity while in office, and then 
wasn't always, you know, had sort of rough midterm periods as well when, when things were not going well for him. And, and that we tend to think of two-term presidents somehow kind of get frozen in, in, in amber in, in the imagination, like everything was great and they were always popular. And if you look at almost every president, including our two-term ones, including some of our greatest ones, you know, Roosevelt, Reagan, the ones who really are at the top of those, those lists that are, that are crafted from time to time, they had really, um, there were many times where it really looked like it was not going to work. So the, um, and, and the economy, you know, can sink or swim a president and your ability to, to, for the policies to actually have an effective, an effect on it, it makes a big difference. So that's, those are some things. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you talked last time uh, about voter turnout and trends from previous election. I'm just curious if you can recall the voter turnout in 1932 and maybe compare it to a couple of the, elect, uh, the elections, presidential elections in the 1920s? That is a great question. I don't know off the top of my head, but it's a great opening for me to say, follow me on Twitter and I'll put it in a tweet. Um, <laughs> um, uh, generally speaking, it's been kind of up and down. Um, it, it, you never get to 19th century levels again. You know, uh, you don't get the, the really, really high levels of, of voter turnout. But I can't, off the top of my head, think of what 1932 was. So uh, my question actually kind of follows on that. Mm -hmm. um, two-part question. One, uh, I don't think women had had the vote for very long by the 1932 election, so mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if there was any particular, as you said, constituencies and mm -hmm. were women any, any part of that. Um, and the other is, uh, we all know about um, President Roosevelt's famous wife, um, and you didn't mention that, and I was wondering if the 1932 election was too soon to ha for her to have any role mm -hmm. in, um, and what was to become, obviously, in 2012, women having a lot of vote and first ladies having a lot more um, say in the political presidential campaign process. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, well, the, the, the sort of the modern um, uber or ornamental superwoman first lady has not come into being in 1932. Um, it's, she's more on the ornamental side, and as, and as we know from Eleanor Roosevelt, she didn't like being anyone's ornament. Um, but uh, to answer the second part of your question first, she was, of course, much on the scene and very much a kind of, um, uh, kind of there, kind of, you know, help, helping, you know, visible in the campaign, but not visible as a, as a sort of independent-minded um, policy advisor, but she also um, had very little patience for the kind of, you know, the, the real, you know, it came to be a drag after a while. She, she kind of, she parachuted in when she felt like she might get something out of it. You know, on the Whistle Stop Tour, she, she was part of the whole pageantry, and she would, you know, come on the, the, the back of the train before Roosevelt and, and say something and then go in. But then there were other times when she just stayed on the sidelines. She, she was selective about what she, but she, she understood the role of a political wife. The, um, her, her real kind of, her, her role as, a, as an independent um, uh, kind of crusader and having a set of issues on which she was much more out front, particularly racial integration than her husband, really emerges um, publicly in the sort of the, her, his later terms and, and, and privately when, once they enter the White House. The question of, of women getting the vote is a very interesting one, and one person who really was paying attention to the female vote was Herbert Hoover. I talked about how in 28 he sliced and diced the electorate and thought about interest groups, and one interest group that he really um, pursued very, very uh, aggressively was women voters, and, and, and particularly sort of middle class um, white native born women voters, these sort of progressive women turned, turned matrons. And, uh, and, but the, of course, the great th the thought was that suffrage was going to sort of transform the electoral landscape on a number of different levels. Um, but then the reality was that women tend to vote class over gender uh, on many cases, that they voted for, they voted like their husbands, not necessarily because their husbands told them how to vote, although that was the assumption, that was one of the arguments against suffrage, um, but that they tended to vote their economic interests. And so uh, the, 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 the female voter is, is less visible as a, as, as a sort of, as, as a gender, as, as a, a, just voting on six issues. It was just, it was, the economic situation was dictating the vote in 32 as it did in 28. From 1860 to 1932, you had 72 years with only two Democratic presidents. How do you explain the Republican dominance over 72 years? That's a um, part of it was number as a numbers game that the Republican strongholds were the places that were the most densely populated. So um, with the Republicans having strongholds in the Northeast, Midwest, 
um, you and the and the Democratic strongholds being the much more lightly populated and more 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 rural um, South and West. Uh, you just had more you just had more people, and that reflects itself congressionally as well, you know in the, in the makeup of the legislature. One of the one slide that um, I could have shown that, that I think that illustrates this and, and uh, is a is a kind of a, a map that that shows a the electoral breakdown. Sorry, the popular vote breakdown for the 1932 election. We, I showed the electoral map, which is a very clear-cut landslide. But if you actually um, uh, map that out and, and do um, alter the map so you're showing kind of where the, the, the fattest part, the most population is, you know, where the, the population centers are, you see this huge bump on the eastern seaboard, this big red bump for Hoover. Now, he only won a few states, but it, they were the most, some of the most populous states. And some of the most lightly settled states were Democratic. And that kind of reflects the conundrum the Democrats faced, that it was very hard to win nationally. Um, and, and the other thing that Democrats had the problem was, was, was the, the South and segregation and the question of, of race and, and sectionalism. And the fact that you had a, a party that was trying to cobble together these interests um, that were, um, you know, you have Southern whites on the one hand, you have um, working class whites, uh, urban whites in the Northeast on the other hand, you have Western populace trying to get all these people to sing the same song at the same time. And what does is economic crisis. When it becomes this widespread, deeply felt crisis, it's so touched by so many, touches so many people that that brings um, the party together, the constituencies, and brings new people into the party in ways that didn't before. And you really only see the, the emergence of, of what becomes called the New Deal Coalition in 1936. In 1932, for example, a lot of um, you know, African Americans are, um, some are voting Democrat, but by and large they're voting Republican, the party of Lincoln. They're not voting for the white Southern segregationists, even if Roosevelt is their fig, you know, the guy who's leading the whole charge. By 1936, the New Deal has affected so many people, or so many people feel like it's, it's the sort of thing that's working for them and in their interest that um, people like you know, African Americans, both Southern and Northern, um, and Southern again, when they can vote, um, are voting Democrat. So you see this transition and the making of the modern Democratic Party that allows it to have this electoral dominance. You just get the numbers. You get more numbers. All right, you guys want to go and watch the debate. So go. Thank you.